Dearly beloved, we are gathered together here in the sight of God and in the face of this company to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony. Earlier this week, I got a text message from Clarkson. Exactly how long is it from the door to the chancel step? I said, Clarkson, we're not putting an extension on the nave. Mita, you are a beautiful bride. That, that dress is amazing. And you know, Clarkson, he's a good foil. We are often told that marriage is dying. It's the kind of message, conversation that's been around now for a few decades, and there is some evidence we can point to for it. The whole definition of marriage, of course, has changed in our lifetimes. And not only the definition, but also the practice. But perhaps it is dying because we have forgotten that marriage is indeed always about dying. The very first reflection on marriage, Lord has made Adam, he saw that it was not good for him to be alone, and so the Lord causes Adam to fall into a deep sleep, a death-like state. Marriage is a kind of death. That's what I'm suggesting we find in the very first account of marriage. It is an end to living for yourself, an end to living by yourself. And yet, Clarkson and Amita look reasonably cheerful. They are even here willingly. They have exchanged their vows and promises without coercion, and that joy, that voluntary, free-willing, binding themselves under obligation to each other, that is not foolish or in vain. For if death is at the heart of the Christian marriage, it is the death that gives life. Pour upon you the riches of his grace, sanctify and bless you, that ye may please him both in body and soul and live together in holy love unto your lives end. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and abide with you always. I gotta know what is over the edge. Smile from you.